Hi, I am Elizabeth Rubin, a journalist, a former colleague of David Rose at the New York Times. And I'm um, here with David, a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, many Pulitzer Prize winning journalists, and author of the new book, In Deep, The FBI, The CIA, and The Truth About America's Deep State. Hi, David. How are you doing? I'm great. And thank you, Elizabeth, um, for doing this and um, being such a great colleague over so many years and a friend. Anytime. Sorry, I should just disclose that. Um, but she's going to be tough on me, she said. So here we go. Where are you exactly? Uh, I'm up in Maine. Uh, we left New York um, just as the pandemic started. Um, my wife has reduced lung capacity and um, we're up here staying with family and it's, um, we're very lucky. We've got it very easy up here. That's great. I'm glad to hear that. And well, your book is city? really wonderful and um, I'm probably not the first person to ask you this. Can you tell us what is the deep state? Uh, I'll, I'll kind of bury or I'll, I'll ruin the whole interview by saying um, I, I conclude that the term, uh, yeah. the deep state is sort of political rhetoric that Donald Trump uses to marginalize experts, you know, members of the intelligence community, uh, Tony Fauci in terms of a public health expert, mm -hmm. and just to dismiss them. I do think there is a, a permanent government, um, right. you know, uh, that both liberals and, and uh, conservatives fear. Um, liberals talk more about, they use the, you know, I think a better term is the military industrial complex. Right. And Eisenhower's talk of defense contractors and generals who push us into endless wars. And then conservatives talk about the administrative state. And that's sort of an ever growing federal bureaucracy that's invading our lives and taking away our, our rights and, and freedoms. But mm -hmm. deep state, I, I don't like the term. It's very effective. The president's a great communicator. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's- Where does it come it from? So it's an old, it's been around for decades. Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, Turkey was where I first found it was used. Political scientists have talked about it in terms of the Turkish military, kind of thwarting the emergence of democracy there. Um, some people have talked about it in uh, Egypt. Um, for viewers, right. earlier we were, the, the poster behind Elizabeth's shoulder is a, an Egyptian yes. movie poster. Um, mm -hmm. I've done very little reporting there. Elizabeth has done far more, but it was also, there was a talk of a deep state in Egypt again a powerful sort of military and intelligence uh, nexus that would thwart the emergence of democracy in Egypt. Um, but it, it was used for decades in both of those countries, but it's only really recently it's been used in the US. So it has nothing to do with deep throat, like it didn't have that kind of... No, uh, no, and one of the characters in the book, and we can talk about this later, uh, Deep Throat is actually a, a senior FBI official. This is all public, Mark Felt. But right. he was involved in, in terrible FBI abuses in the 60s right. and 70s and actually put on trial for that. And he never revealed that he was Deep Throat, the source um, for Woodward and Bernstein uh, and Watergate. Um, but no, it's, uh, it, it, I don't know how, where it emerged in Turkey or Egypt. Um, uh, and it was, but it was first brought to the U.S. by a, um, that I found a, a, a professor at, at UC Berkeley. Um, I can talk about more about about that U.S. history if you want, but. Yes, um, yes, why not? Tell us. Yeah. So his, his, the first reference I found was, uh, his name is Peter Dale Scott. I, I tracked him down. He's now retired. Um, he comes at, comes at it from sort of the liberal perspective. He sees the deep state um, more in terms of the military industrial complex, but also Wall Street and sort of big corporate and financial interests. And I think, and I'm mm -hmm. going to get this wrong, but I, he first so more, wrote Sorry, about just it. interrupt you Go for ahead. one second. It's more like an economic corporate deep state. Correct. That that right. there is, and again, the the the, and it's it's so to back up and and you're right to interrupt me. You know there is a problem. The American public on the left and the right thinks that there are unelected powers, whether it's mm -hmm. wealthy bankers or mm -hmm. big defense contractors or CIA and FBI officials that are secretly running the country. Um, and there is an element of that, and you know we'll talk about it. And that's very yeah. dangerous. Elected politicians including President Trump, the elected president of the United States, you know, should have power. The bureaucrats should carry out the president's orders if they're, if they're legal. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that's a basic thing of democracy. So that's one thing that, that Trump is right about. But there's this deep, deep suspicion uh, that goes beyond Trump on the right and the left. And I think, you know, mainstream journalists like us you know, would, would be kidding ourselves if we don't recognize how alienated people are 
uh, from the government, from the media, and, and these kind of things. So Peter Dale Scott, it's a post 9-11 uh, suspicion. There were conspiracy theories that, you know, uh, the CIA uh, and the Mossad together had staged 9-11. Um, that was widespread, you know, from your own reporting, um, you know, in the Middle East, but even Americans believed it. So I think it was 2003 or 2007, I should know this, but um, Peter Dale Scott wrote a book called The Road to 9-11, and it blamed, it was the first place I found where the term deep state was applied to the U.S. government. And he blamed the deep state for the, dragging the U.S. into wars over and over again, and particularly mm -hmm. for, for facilitating or engineering 9-11, so that the U.S. military could then you know, invade Afghanistan and Iraq. And so he, it was a critique uh, more along the lines Wait, of the- Wait, yeah, to interrupt you again, did he believe that the U.S. intentionally facilitated 9-11? No, I think that he, he his thesis would be um, that the military and intelligence sort of complex took advantage of the 9-11 attacks okay. to then carry out invasions and boost its mm -hmm. budgets and, its, and get more power, surveil Americans and do whatever they wanted. And then what's interesting here is that he comes out with this book um, after 2001, and he ends up, uh, there's interest in him on the right. So Alex Jones, the far right conspiracy theorist right. In, with Info his InfoWars Wars program, mm -hmm. has Peter Dale Scott on as a guest. And, you know, Peter Dale Scott talks about the deep state. This is all in the mid 2000s. And it was interesting talking to, to Scott recently, the Durham sort of takes off and it starts um, circulating on the right. It's still on the fringes, but as the term has become so pronounced sort of post-Trump's election, Scott feels like uh, the, the term has been sort of misused. It's been, uh, it's been cheapened and, mm -hmm. and that it's, it's, so, it's applied so broadly now that it's, it's gone beyond the definition he wanted to use. He still thinks there are powerful corporate and Wall Street and defense industry interests that have all this influence in Washington, and that's where he thinks the focus Which should be. true. It is true, and 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 <laughs> I, I, mean, I, I, and this is the challenge of the Trump era and trying to write this book that um, these are uh, there's huge economic bias in our policies. The CIA and the FBI and the NSA are more powerful than ever. Ed, Edward Snowden showed that, but Donald Trump's allegation that there's a coup being plotted against him. Mm -hmm. uh, the claim that Tony Fauci is part of some conspiracy to undermine President Trump, that is false. Like that's an exaggeration, an exaggeration that's, you know, Trump makes for political gain. Um, but we, we need to figure out how to control these agencies and we need to how to, you know, the government and maybe journalists need to figure out how do you make Americans trust their own government more. So in, in your, well, actually, before I ask you that, what, what just, why did you decide to write this? Like, what, did something happen? Did you, what inspired this? I, um, I had uh, two things. Uh, a former CIA official um, who I'd met overseas, but had retired. Um, it was during 2016. It was a period when people didn't really expect Trump to, to win. But he complained to me that um, technology, the internet, and, you know, texting and, everything we have now was leading to all this micromanagement of CIA station chiefs in the field by um, CIA leaders in Washington and, and politicians in Washington. And so he claimed that, that instead of the CIA being rogue and doing things that were, you know, not authorized, mm -hmm. the problem was that politicians were sort of politicizing intelligence, that they would limit any intelligence they would produce in the field, um, right. different would hype it if it helped that politician's agenda, or they'd bury it if it didn't agree with that politician's agenda. So he said, you should be looking at, you know, we're, we're obeying the system, and we can talk about the system that emerges in the 70s, and are they really obeying or not? But he said yeah. that we're doing the right thing, uh, the intelligence officers in the field, um, it's the politicians that are, you know, abusing uh, the, the system. And that, that sort of surprised me. And then the last thing, there was a poll that came out, and I think early 2017 that showed that 70% of Americans believe that uh, there were unelected officials in Washington who were secretly influencing government policy. This was uh, in 2016 or 17? 2017. And I started right. the book then. Like it, it, it became, most people didn't know what the term deep state actually meant. But mm -hmm. when you said, do you believe there's a group of unelected officials in Washington who secretly influence government policy? 
seven in 10 Americans said yes. I think six in 10 thought they were being improperly surveilled. Wow. And just the last thing about that poll, the two groups with the highest fear of the government were on the right, um, mm -hmm. NRA members, and then on the left, and this makes sense in the wake, obviously, of George Floyd's killing, but uh, racial minorities. Um, again, this very broad lack of trust in, in government. In Had something particular happened with this CIA agent where he, where he or she was particularly personally affected? Uh, so it was, it's Richard Blee, who's a character in the book. And he okay, talks right. about feeling yeah. that, um, you know, his, his father was in the CIA. And, and, and this is a danger of the book. And many people who watch this might be like, why are you hanging out with CIA officials? And of course, he's lying to you. Uh, Richard Blee's father was a senior CIA official during the Cold War. Um, right. But he, he complained. He was chasing al-Qaeda early on. He worked in and then ran Alex Station, which was trying to find uh, bin Laden before 9-11. Uh -huh. But he felt that uh, when Bill Clinton ordered missile strikes at a pharmaceutical plant in Sudan, that was, there was, you know, it, the, the intelligence was unclear, um, according to Blee, and he felt that Clinton launched that uh, missile strike because he was trying to divert attention from the Monica Lewinsky scandal. And that was sort of the first example, you know, in his career of politics getting in the way of what he thought should have been a more aggressive response uh, or a more direct response in Afghanistan. Um, to al-Qaeda. Then the coal bombing happens. And there was again, that was right, that was in the September 2000, right before Gore and Bush have, you know, one of the closest elections in U.S. history. Mm -hmm. And again, there's a lack of response. He's a hardliner. He wants to hit back bin Laden in Afghanistan aggressively. And again, Clinton sort of uh, doesn't really do anything because it's just before the election. And, and so this is, again, politics interfering in what he felt was national security. But so he brings this up to you 16 years later? Yeah. I mean, he, he was talking about it more in terms of micromanagement and um, uh, the hyper politics of Washington. Right. Um, Benghazi had happened. This sense of, of, of be cautious. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. if, if anything goes wrong, it's going to, you know, destroy the boss, sorry, the, the career of the political leader in Washington. Right. Right. So, so he's just said the micromanagement and the caution was, you know, preventing the CIA from operating effectively. And look, you know, Blee, um, you know, uh, you know, was in, well, he wouldn't, he, I, he wouldn't say it in detail, but he was operating in Afghanistan and Pakistan. This is where the U.S. was carrying out drone strikes. There's a lot of people who would say he has no credibility, but he, he stood by the drone strikes. He, you know, stood by the, he, he was haunted by 9-11. He tried to find bin Laden in time. Uh, the book describes this, uh, didn't, um, felt he'd failed the American people and, um, you know, was, was frustrating with how politicized everything was getting. So, okay, so he's kind of this, the beginning nugget, the inspiration that you get. And then you go with the Senate Investigation Committee, right? Yeah. With the church and so and it's, you know, he claims that there was, you know, Blee is telling me in 2016, there's kind of a rules of the road for how the CIA is supposed to operate um, differently than during the Cold War. And so I, the book starts in the 70s. There's this big mm -hmm. Senate investigation called the Church Committee. Frank Church, a senator from Idaho, mm -hmm. ran it. Um, it was great reporting by uh, Seymour Hersh, then mm -hmm. of the New York Times, about all kinds of everything from CIA assassinations abroad, um, you know, to the CIA operating in the U.S., uh, rumors of J. Edgar Hoover uh, surveilling and harassing Martin Luther King. So this it's an amazing sort of bipartisan investigation. It's kind right. of uh, hokey. What's to, some of the most interesting now. stuff that came out of that, that like the most startling to you? Um, when you think about it. I, there were, I'll cite your, your, for the record, everybody, Elizabeth is a better writer than I am. And so she's trying to pull out uh, human stories. No, no, it's true. Actually, I've, I've got one. But the, the scale of the abuses, the FBI like open files and carried out investigations on a half a million Americans that were engaged in legal political activity. You know, it was their constitutional right. They weren't doing anything criminal. So they were surveilling and harassing and infiltrating groups on the right, the John Birch Society, and then famously Martin mm -hmm. Luther King. You know, many mm -hmm. people know this. They, he, he was on his way to accept the Nobel Peace Prize and they wrote a fake letter to him and sent him a recording um, of what they said was, you know, a recording that would prove he was having affairs on his wife. And then the letter 
which was this anonymous letter, but typed up by FBI officials, you know, urged Martin Luther King to kill himself before he would go accept the Nobel Peace Prize. And it was part of this broad campaign to discredit him, led by J. Edgar Hoover, because he believed um, he was a communist. Um, you know, they would routinely break into the homes of people and, and wiretap them. They would leave uh, incriminating information in, in homes. They would leave letters to, designed to sort of break up people's marriages. Um, you know, it was rampant. Uh, and, and then what was interesting and in one of the most interesting characters to meet as I started the book was one of the chief investigators for the church committee was a guy named Fritz Schwartz. Um, mm -hmm. Fritz's middle initials were A-O, so his <laughs> name is F-A-O Schwartz. A -O Schwartz. Mm -hmm. He's a, uh, a blue blood, uh, a, a young, uh, a skion, if that's the right word, um, of yeah. the family that owns the, the toy store in New York. And he'd gone to Harvard, and so he started debriefing um, as part of the church committee all of these former CIA and FBI officials. And it was a select committee um, and their goal was to see the extent of wrongdoing by all these agencies during the Cold War. He thought he would identify more and sort of um, get along better with the CIA officials. At that point, the CIA was dominated by sort of Ivy League wasps like himself. Um, mm -hmm. He found it, you know, blood chilling to talk to these CIA officials. He watched uh, Bill Colby, a former CIA director, just lie through his teeth. And he said Colby was the best liar he'd ever seen. That, that Fritz, the chief investigator for the committee, couldn't catch him in a lie. He was, wow. uh, Colby was so good at it. And then he came to kind of like the FBI agents more. Um, they were sort of, he said they sort of went to Fordham and they were, sorry, this is pejorative, but sort of more working class. Right. He was really alarmed. He was more alarmed by what the FBI did because they were undermining American democracy, um, you know, infiltrating Vietnam War uh, protest groups, Students for a Democratic Society, um, spreading mm -hmm. disinformation, you know, getting on walkie talkies and trying to confuse demonstrators to disrupt what they were doing. Um, you know, there, there was all these dirty tricks that they were running um, to stop the anti-war movement. And so he was more angry at the FBI. He felt that was a deeper threat to American democracy, even though he liked the FBI agents better. And just the last thing, um, it was interesting talking to the FBI agents because they all said they had to do these things. They had to, to break the law to protect the country. And right. you've seen Elizabeth, but all the places we've covered over the years, the, I think there's certain people that break the law because they like to break the law or they just right. like power. The danger to me is how people rationalize their actions. Mm -hmm. So all these FBI agents said, I, I did this to kind of prevent communists from infiltrating America and destroying you know, our way of life and, and my family. And, and they really believed it. And when you start, mm -hmm rationalizing illegal actions, it, it doesn't stop and it gets very dangerous. So what were the consequences of the expose of all of these, you know, the revelations of all of these illegal break-ins and, and, you know, twisting of facts and did, it, did anything come out of it? So yes, and sorry for the previous <laughs> long answer. I, I just, no, no, great answer. Short, I want the no, detail. He's a great guy. Do not give us short answers, please. <laughs> I want detail. So this is a little drier, but it's extraordinary going back and looking at it. This whole system, there's some Watergate reforms in response right. to Nixon and then the church reforms. So a very, and it's about reining in the CIA and the FBI and reining in out of control presidents. So new intelligence committees are created in the House and the Senate as a mm -hmm. result of this investigation. There's a new uh, FISA court uh, with the federal judges in it that are supposed to approve all surveillance inside the United States. Again, the basic idea there is that you're going to have all three branches overseeing the FBI and CIA and competing right. judges and members of Congress and the president to control these groups. Um, mm -hmm. there's also, Jimmy Carter comes in and he uh, puts in law the, the existence of independent counsels like Robert Mueller or Archibald Cox, you know, who was fired during Watergate to investigate right. wrongdoing by the executive branch. FBI directors are limited to 10 year terms, so you don't have a J. Edgar Hoover there for 40 years. Inspectors general are, are created. These are the, there was just an inspector general created to look at the trillions in spending in coronavirus relief. Trump fired that inspector general. But again, these are officials appointed by Congress to look at what the executive branch is doing. Um, uh, last thing, the CIA now has to produce written they're called covert action findings. They describe a covert program that the CIA is going to carry out overseas. The president has to sign that written finding. I mean, they're vague. The 
the CIA can do things, but copies of those findings after the president signed them are given to the leaders of both houses in Congress and the leaders of, of I'm sorry, both parties in Congress and the, the, also the leaders of the intelligence committees from both parties as well. And that, again, this is where you had these informal vague conversations where the CIA would go do things. Now it's in writing. Uh, Ford and Carter embraced all these reforms. So it was these kind of rules of the road for a guy like Rich Blee, who said, there's a presidential finding, I can go do X, Y, and Z in this country. And I'm not gonna, if a new president's elected, you know, I'm not gonna be sort of put on trial by the new American president, you know, who disagrees with what the last American president um, asked me to do. And, and so when Trump says it's out of control and no one knows what's going on, there's this massive system that was created in the late 70s that's not perfect, but it, it still exists. Um, and Is that why yeah. Obama would not prosecute CIA agents for carrying out Bush's orders? Correct. So what, what changes after the church reforms is that it isn't, you know, the CIA doing stuff secretly without the president knowing. It's not, you know, J. Edgar Hoover sending out guys without the president knowing. The presidents, by the way, during the Cold War knew about a lot of bad stuff and, and condoned it. Mm -hmm. This is, we get to 9-11 and it's George W. Bush deciding, I'm going to order the CIA to go out and carry out rendition and torture and do it in secret. And I, as president, have the power to do it to protect the country. And then more importantly, that FISA court, the federal judges that are supposed to authorize all surveillance, Bush just ignores that. He and Cheney uh, carry out now this, you know, famous, famous warrantless mass surveillance where they just say, I, I don't need the approval of the judicial branch. I, in terms of national security, can, can carry out mass surveillance on my own. That's broken by, you know, Jim Risen and Eric Licklau right. in the New York Times. Mm -hmm. But so the system is already sort of being weakened, but the difference is it, it's an out of control president, not out of control FBI and CIA in 2001. Wait, wait a minute. Now, Clapper, was he, <laughs> hold on, you, was Clapper working, what was he working on? What was he so in Clapper the was, he was, well, it's really, he's, he's by, he's the head of the Defense Intelligence Agency. He's a career person. He's yeah. fascinating because his father works for the NSA. Right. He believes in intelligence. He believes that, you know, the intelligence community speaks truth to power and they inform policymakers and, you know, we'll get into his, yeah, the whole, his, his testimony yeah. and the Snowden thing, yeah. but he's, He's a character in the book also um, of, you know, here meet somebody who spends their career in the intelligence uh, area. Joan Dempsey uh, is a woman who rises through from a Navy sort of officer in intelligence all the way up to being the number three official at the CIA. But I mention her because both um, uh, Dempsey um, and Clapper are involved with Iraq WMD. And this is just a pure intelligence failure where, and Dempsey and Clapper both said it, that they were so afraid, they were, the, the intelligence community was so ashamed in a way, and I'm not justifying what they did by missing 9-11, that they overreacted to the WMD argument in Iraq. They said there was pressure, for, they clearly, Bush and Cheney wanted the intelligence community to say there was WMD in Iraq, but both of them said the intelligence community was kind of happy to come to that finding based on flimsy evidence because they didn't want to miss, you know, a big threat to the country and have another 9-11 carried out on their watch. Um, one critique of the book I've gotten is that, you know, I'm too easy on these intelligence officials and the intelligence community in general, that they haven't performed well. They missed 9-11. They were wrong about Iraq WMD. Um, and they, you know, continue to miss things. Uh, and I think that's a, that's a fair uh, critique. Did you want to tell it more from their point of view rather than get into a critique of their actions? I did. And I, you know, another, and this is all kind of, this is the spinach. <laughs> one other, you know, one other thing that comes out of the seventies is that Jimmy Carter, like we have, the federal government is full of professional civil servants. Yeah. Um, like back to the 1800s when basically every federal employee was somebody who got the job because they were politically loyal to the presidents. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and there was part of the progressive movement was to try to have civil service exams and have people work for government in their careers and, and have, you know, there be less patronage. So the system evolves. Uh, there's the Hatch Act, which bars, you know, federal employees from engaging in political activities. That came about in the 40s because Democrats were using federal employees to help them win elections. 
And then Jimmy right. Carter does another reform. Um, so there's something called the Senior Executive Service, and Joan Dempsey is in that. But the point is, you know, there's all kinds of regulations barring career officials, the ones that Donald Trump, sorry, Donald Trump is accusing of carrying out coups, where they're under all this oversight by Congress and mm. different parts of the executive branch. And look, they're not perfect. They're bureaucrats, and we can talk about that more. They, they spin, they leak. They want to, you know, boost their own, uh, you know, their own organization's budgets mm -hmm. and, and standing. But there's this huge system that's been evolved over the decades to try to, you know, control them from, you know, plotting coups that, that Trump um, completely ignores. So I just decided to do a series of characters in the book that, you know, spent their careers um, working on in intelligence. Mm -hmm. And just one other one, and we're, I'll, I'll stop for the, Will Hurd, he's a member of Congress right. now, a Republican was a CIA officer for a decade after 9-11, and he you know, becomes a character later during the Trump era. But it's essentially a group of uh, FBI and CIA officials that I track, um, starting in the 70s when this new system comes out to kind of control right. them through the, through the Trump era. One of the conflicts that I found really interesting and also the way that you wove the two characters together, of course, is Attorney General William Barr and James Clapper. And it seems like from their backgrounds, though, Barr is like this Upper West Side New Yorker, sort of elite, well-educated. Clapper comes from more of an army, or actually, I guess- He's an army brat. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like obsessed with breaking codes and, you know, that kind of stuff. And yet they both have a suspicion of, of executive power being, being curbed in any way. And they don't both seem to have a suspicion of congressional oversight, right? in the way that you yep. described their early years. And yet by 2019, like they both seem on the same track in some ways, conservatively. 2019, you have Barr accusing Clapper of being part of the deep state, you know, organizing the, the investigations of Trump. How does that happen? It's Donald Trump. He, he is such a polarizing sort of figure that he sort of, you know, the establishment, kind of the Washington establishment sort of splits in a way. And the vast majority of the establishment kind of, I think, turns against Trump. Uh, Barr obviously joins the, the Trump camp. But you're right about Clapper. And again, it's, you know, since the, with the protests that are going on now, um, Clapper, you know, the NSA was kind of performing surveillance on Americans on like, you know, yeah. uh, the Vietnam War groups. And I asked Clapper about that. And he supported those activities in the 70s, saying like the cities were burning and you know, the government needs to sort of maintain order. So you're absolutely right about how similar they are. Um, the difference is that, you know, Clapper comes to the conclusion that, you know, Trump is um, undermining all of the, he, he does, and Clapper is a controversial figure, but yeah. Clapper claims that there are facts and they got the facts wrong in Iraq. Um, he gave this, you know, uh, problematic, uh, Ron Wyden and many others say false answer about the extent of surveillance uh, um, that Snowden revealed later on, but but Clapper claims that the job of intelligence officials is to give, you know, unvarnished unvarnished facts to policymakers and to the president, so that they will make decisions that will not risk the lives of American soldiers needlessly or endanger the country. Uh, many people will dismiss that, but um, you know, Clapper just will dismiss what? They, well, they will. So it's, this is a broader argument, and we face it like, um, so the, the flip side of this is the, what I heard about Donald Trump's mentality. So Clapper claims basically there's objective fact, that mm -hmm. there, you can present a presidential daily brief that kind of more or less, you know, tells you what's happening and do it in a relatively objective way, like a kind of theoretically very straight newspaper story. And what I heard about, you know, Trump is that he, you know, grows up in this hyper competitive world of New York real estate, and he just he thinks that everybody is kind of putting a little spin on the ball, exaggerating right. a fact, you know, trying to get advantage somehow. So he doesn't believe that the, you know, the reporters sitting in front of him in the White House press conference, you know, are asking, you know, straight facts. I mean, clearly everybody's performing to a certain extent in a, in a press mm -hmm. conference, but he just mm -hmm. thinks that, that government experts like certain presidents more than others, that these career government officials are like carrying out the orders of, one president faster than other. He doesn't sort of believe in the concept of nonpartisan public service. He thinks people just don't act that way. 
Right. I think an imperfect version of that exists. And I think you have to believe, I don't know, it's easy to hold him up, but like you know, Dr. Tony Fauci, like you need, the pandemic shows us, you need some kind of basic level of objective fact that the public and policymakers can agree on so you can respond to a pandemic. And otherwise you just get um, the kind of chaos we see, uh, I think coming from Trump. So just to go back though for one minute. So do, do, do Barr and Clapper ever like overlap and have a relationship? No, they never meet. Um, and then the big split here is that, um, and thank you again, everybody else is doing, <laughs> you're doing a great job. So why does Barr end up with Trump? And this again goes back to the trauma of the 70s. So there, all these reforms are enacted to control, like I said, out of control presidents. Um, and there's a group of conservatives. One of them is Antonin Scalia, mm -hmm. who is a legal scholar, you know, and, and then he's in the Justice Department in the Ford administration. Uh, and then there's two White House staffers, uh, Dick Cheney and Donald right. Rumsfeld, who worked mm -hmm. for Ford. Um, right. And together, they come up with this belief that the post-Watergate reforms weaken the American presidency, that uh, the War Powers Act, for example, which was, again, separate, but it was another example of Congress saying to the president, you can't make war without the legislative branch's approval. Um, uh, there were many uh, conservative people who felt that Roe v. Wade and many of the court decisions that moved ahead the liberal agenda, um, you know, was, again, an infringement on the kind of president's power, that the judges were gaining too much power. So Barr agrees with this theory that the executive branch and the president were, were, were weakened too much after Watergate. Ed right. Meese argues this through the Reagan era. Um, right. But Reagan and Bush and even George W. Bush all sort of buy this basic belief post-Nixon that if you don't respect Congress and the courts as a president, it's going to hurt you politically, that you have to embrace the sort of division, mm -hmm. the three equal branches of government. Um, but Bill Barr, his whole career, um, you know, he's believed that the presidency um, is the most important branch in terms of saving the country. He gave a speech um, at the Federal Society last fall where he said, if you look at history and when there's the country's threatened by war or, de you know, economic depression or natural disaster, it's, it's the presidency that acts decisively and saves the country. And he argued that, you know, Trump's travel ban being blocked by some federal judge on the West Coast was an example of the president being un unable to act in the way he should, and that all these congressional investigations of Trump are just harassment uh, and improper. And he, you know, it's, uh, I've used the term ideologue meets grifter, like uh, right. Bill Barr That's does good. believe that there should be a strong presidency. And then some folks describe the president as a grifter. He's a grifter. He, he is a <laughs> Yes, we know um, that. Yeah. And but I think doesn't Bill, it also, Bill Barr believes Doesn't it also that, though, but... depend, isn't what underlies this, that it depends on what you believe saving the country is? I mean, there's no, Correct. you know, it, Barr Bill believes Barr, one thing and, and we might believe it's something else. So Bill Barr, you know, sat, you know, Trump talked about dominating the streets and, you know, in these White House meetings yeah. and the calls with governors and Bill Barr used that exact same language. He, he's been this way throughout his career. Barr was also the attorney general under George H.W. Bush. Mm -hmm. So when the Rodney King riots happened, Barr mm -hmm. sent 3,000 federal officers to Los Angeles. And in an old interview I found of him, he, he, he said, you know, there should have been federal civil rights charges brought against the officers who beat Rodney King, and then they were acquitted, and that caused the riots. But he, he said they should have brought federal charges against all the rioters also. He thought it was a chance after the Rodney King riots to crack down on all the gangs in Los Angeles. So he, this whole thing where he's, you know, now and more recently with the, the Floyd protests, right. where, where Barr is calling in the National Guard and sending out, you know, Bureau of Prisons agents without insignias to kind of, you know, Barr believes that the way you save the country is through law and order. Clearly, mm -hmm. you know, many Americans don't, but yeah. you know, he's always been this way. And in the process now, he's, you know, what's amazing about right now is he's enabling Donald Trump. And of course, Clapper would agree with him. <laughs> yes, and, and that this is this key kind of 2016 split. And, and I get to, I mean, a term I use in the book and, and, and um, it's not very artful, 
Another way that you can talk about the permanent government or the institutional government. Right. And so Clapper, and I say institutional government because I think, look, everybody has political bias, including, you know, government yeah. workers. But when I say institutional government, it's the, their bias is towards their institution. Mm -hmm. So I think what happened with Clapper is that when, when Trump started attacking the intelligence community I see. in 2016, right. and, when, and then they, and they saw, and you know, the Russians had been doing disinformation stuff in the U.S. for decades, mm -hmm. but as they saw the extent of disinformation that was going on in 2016, Trump, I'm sorry, Clapper became genuinely concerned that Trump was sort of tacitly you know, working with the Russians or possibly colluding with them. Right. And so that combination leads, you know, the, the fact that Trump is attacking the intelligence community and sort of defaming all these people that Clapper had worked with that Clapper turns on. So in your reporting and in talking to people who are the so-called deep state, <laughs> in Trump's view, right? Forget the yeah. term, we don't, but the people that he's attacking, how do they continue, how do they justify staying in their jobs? How do they how do they sort of square like, I disagree with everything this guy is saying and doing, but I'm gonna to try to keep doing this job even as he's destroying departments and institutions. And what do they say? They say, I spent some time with like FBI agents and they, they're they like, you know, they say like they like to just go kick in doors and like get bad guys. Right. And they, they there's a discussion. They can still always, do that. They can still do that. And there's kind of a, um, so another character in the book is a guy named Tom O'Connor. He was a cop from Northampton, Massachusetts in Western Massachusetts. He joins the FBI just before 9-11. Uh, he ends up investigating the USS Cole bombing in Yemen, travels the world. Uh, he's at the Pentagon after 9-11, uh, recovering uh, the bodies of victims there. Uh, he even goes to Iraq after the invasion there and investigates the Blackwater security guard shooting of, mm -hmm. of, uh, of people there. But if you fast forward to 2018, he's the head of like the FBI Agents Association. It's sort of their, you know, their union. They don't, it's the closest thing to have a union. They're not allowed to have one legally. And he's running this union though during the shutdown where, where you know, Pelosi and Trump have this battle. It's about funding for the border wall and it's the longest shutdown in US history. And, you know, there's like 50,000 FBI employees across the country. They're not getting paid for weeks at a time. Mm -hmm. And there was, you know, uh, you know, younger staffers coming in to senior FBI officials in the 50 field offices around the country, and they're, they're in tears. They can't feed their families. They're worried about missing a credit card payment. Right. Then they, like, lose their security clearance and their livelihood. Um, they ended up setting up um, food pantries in FBI offices around the country so that, you know, FBI employees could mm -hmm. help each other. And it's, you know, we're sitting here being sympathetic towards the FBI, the people that were rogue in the, in the 70s. But what struck me yeah. in spending yeah. time with them is that they, the FBI is divided like the country. Like a lot of people love Donald Trump and the FBI and a lot of people hate him. Mm -hmm. And what worried me is that, so O'Connor recently retired. He had this amazing career and he, and, and what's, he investigated white, you know, supremacists as well. So from Al Qaeda to white supremacists, you know, uh, yeah. he said his job was like, you know, investigating evil in all of its forms. But I said to him, now you're retired you know, there's this deep disgust for sort of the political class among FBI agents. Like, would you ever run for office to try to make things better? And he was like, no, no, David, you know, I'd want to do something that had actual meaning. Yeah. And so that level of disgust with like our political process and Congress, and also frankly, the media, you know, is a bad sign. And I worry that, you know, maybe the FBI is too big, but I think you need a, a group of people that are willing to work from this, you know, the Center for Disease Control to, you know, the EPA to the FBI, you know, with the strong, you know, the strong supervision of elected politicians. Again, the elected leader should That's call what I out. mean. Like, how do those people work when the president is undermining their agency? There, there is a culture of I'm apolitical. Like, and they kind of use, I'm just going to, I'm carrying out, you know, orders among the kind of people out in field office, or, or even like the federal prosecutors that are out, you know, prosecuting people around the country. Mm -hmm. You know, I think Washington is different or New York. Those are, you know, mm -hmm. more political offices. They, they feel they're public servants. They like, you know, you know, enforcing the law. They like 
I don't know, enforcing environmental regulations. They like working on education policy. So it does dis disturb them that the president is sort of attacking them and calling them, you know, the FBI agents who investigated Trump Russia, you know, the president calling them human scum. Um, but I worry that people just aren't going to want to engage in public service. I think an imperfect form of public service can exist and we need it. Um, you know, and otherwise we won't sort of function as a society um, or a democracy. Oh my goodness. That's pretty <laughs> Well, if you talk about the pandemic, you know, we yeah. can't, the latest polls show that most, you know, liberals think that the, the death tolls um, that the government's higher. giving are, yeah. are, are actually higher, that the government is underestimating them. And then conservatives, think that the death tolls are lower, that it's all underestimated. So it's- it might change though with Texas, Florida, and Arizona. Correct, correct. You know, this but could, it, you know, sorry. but the, no, I agree. It's just that it, it's changed in this week, but you know, it, it was, the pandemic is something I've talked about where it's like, you need to have facts, basic agreed upon facts. The problem though, of course, is that because we're so divided, people don't believe in facts, A, and yes. until it hits you in, in the face and you don't see it and you're not all watching the same news and you're not all getting your facts in the same place, the minute, like, so New York is seen as like this liberal den of evil and of course they're all going to get sick, you know, and or the numbers are exaggerated or they deserve whatever. But now it's hitting in the red states that weren't believing it and you'll, I'm sure you're going to start to see a change in belief. In fact, yes, and it's inevitable, and you know, part of it's the explosion of the web, and I love the web, and it's going to explode. But I think that it's made it the web has made it much easier for massive amounts of disinformation to be spread. Uh, I'm jealous and frustrated, you know, that Facebook and Google, um, you know, uh, and Twitter get to have, you know, when when you post a magazine story or I post a magazine story, we can be sued if it's defamatory or false. You know, they don't face those restrictions. And, uh, you know, I'm not an expert on how you fix that. But so th th part of the problem is just any conspiracy theory you want right or left is a half dozen keystrokes away. And then the last thing, um, you know, um, many politicians, but particularly President Trump, yeah. you know, traffic in conspiracy theories. Yeah. So they, they exacerbate the misinformation, which we're always going to have. But that's what's, you know, particularly destructive about what Trump has done. Do you think that that is why he has ignored or is pretending that he didn't see the briefings about the Russian bounties for, you know, killing, paying the Taliban to kill Americans? I'm sure you saw like today or yesterday, he was like, no, I wasn't briefed. Then it comes out, well, he actually got it in February, the briefing. And the intelligence, unnamed intelligence officials are saying it's absurd and impossible that he didn't see it. It's absurd that anybody would wait for it to be a hundred percent truthful or factual. Remember, because they were saying, "Well, it wouldn't go to him." I think his press secretary said, "Well, it wouldn't go to him until it was confirmed." No, it's, so you it's had that tension between them again. Well, that they they you know the the president uh, and no no president's perfect. And then I'll give you my to be fair to Trump thing. Like every modern president I found has been suspicious of like the bureaucracy and right. Reagan came in and thought the State Department was thwarting his effort to confront communism. Obama right. thought Pentagon generals were leaking, you know, troop increases in Afghanistan to box him in. But no, nobody has been so dismissive of government advice. So I think he was told this, but he just ignored it um, or didn't absorb it. You know, he doesn't read. He doesn't read the, the presidential daily brief. Um, it's the same thing with the coronavirus warnings. He's, he, he's always been suspicious of experts when he ran the Trump organization and, and current White House officials told me this, that, that he, you know, in the White House and when he ran the Trump organization, he would mm -hmm. rely on outsiders to get advice about real estate deals. And now in the White House, he, you know, calls Sean Hannity and, and others and, and relies on those, you know, he's sort of. So you think he might have seen it and just didn't believe it? Didn't want to believe it? You know, he, right. look, he, well, who, you know, the great mystery of, of Trump and oh, Putin, Trump. And, yes. you know, and, and is Putin. there right. compromise or, or is it just that, you know, Donald Trump was dissed by the establishment? Um, uh, Michael Morell, the deputy CIA director yeah. who wrote an endorsement um, of Hillary Trump during the campaign, Morell told me he regretted um, 
running that endorsement that, that an early mistake that the intelligence community made was, was attacking him, having former officials endorse Clinton publicly, right. alienated Trump, made mm -hmm. him see the CIA as political. And mm -hmm. so he, you know, you know, I, I'm not, look, yeah. he should have acted on the intelligence, but the, you know, his, he's already suspicious and he turns on people very quickly. Um, and so the point here is that, you know, there's a lot of people that are um, critical of Brennan and Clapper in their public attacks on Trump. And they say it doesn't really change any minds and it just plays into um, the conspiracy theory that the CIA is this highly political organization that's attacking Trump. Right. So I, you know, and you can even get into journalism. I, I, so oddly, I'm kind of arguing for some people that try to be nonpartisan, including yeah. journalists, reporters who are just on a beat that are, you know, there's plenty of commentators, you know, attacking Trump. But when you kind of take the beat, the debate, and, and I tried to be fair in this book, um, you play into that. I do say that the president's constantly exaggerating and lying and believe the Washington Post that he's, you know, whatever it was, 16,000 false and misleading statements. Um, but I try to kind of understand that, you know, what, the, what are the sincere beliefs that lead Bill Barr to do what, what he's doing? Um, what are the what? The sincere beliefs that lead Bill Barr to do yeah. what he's doing in terms of, um, if that makes any sense, it's like this hyper political environment where, yeah. you know, it's just scorched earth and there are no facts and, you know, just push back on, on any kind of agreement. And I, I worry about where it's leading us. So here's just to put you in Trump's head for a minute, which is impossible, but <laughs> if the deep state, forget that, if this, if the intelligence community is now using surveillance on the Black Lives Matter movement, the police, the protests against police violence, using facial recognition, you know, collecting as much intelligence on everyone out on the streets as possible. Is Trump going to see that as the deep state or as in his interest? I argue in the book, uh, and I've been, there's been mixed reviews, but that he's creating a deep state of his own. Right. And I don't know if it's like a, you know, out of fear um, mm -hmm. or some like plot he has to be an authoritarian leader, but he, you know, has Rudy Giuliani as kind of his private, um, you know, foreign uh, policy apparatus. He has Sean Hannity as kind of a private communications arm of the White House. He's stonewalled efforts by Congress to find out, you know, what, what his policies are and what he's doing. And I, I think that's because of the leaks and, and his fear of everyone attacking him. But the danger is that, you know, he's creating this, this system that has sort of no transparency. Um, no one is being, you know, uh, overseen by Congress or, or the courts. And, and this rationale, the rationalization that he has to kind of tweet his policies out there because no one will carry them out, you know, they're very dangerous because it's a concentration of power um, in, a, in, a, in a way where there's very little transparency. And that's how you get the kind of rationales that lead to abuses, such as calling for like active duty mil military in the streets. So I don't know if he's doing this because he, he wants to be an authoritarian leader or he feels that he's the victim of all these bureaucrats that are undermining him and he has to speak directly to the American people and then, you know, the news media is lying, but it's a really dangerous um, dynamic. And I had current White House officials uh, tell me this. You have, I'm just going to say one more thing. You have this great sure. quote where Frank Church is interviewed on Meet the Press, you know, and he says, and he's warning about the technological advances. He says it could be turned on, this is what, in 1972? Yep. could be turned on the American people and used to facilitate a system of government surveillance. No American would have any privacy left, such as the capability to monitor everything. Telephone conversations, telegram doesn't, telegrams, <laughs> it doesn't matter. <laughs> there would be no place to hide. And then he says at the end of it, he goes, uh, we must see to it that this agency and all agencies that possess this technology operate within the law and under proper supervision so that we never cross over that abyss. That is the abyss from which there is no return. Aren't we kind of in that abyss? I, uh, we I, are. We and, are. Yeah. And so Congress is going to stop doing effective oversight of the intelligence community because it's become so partisan. Yeah. You know, the, the, com the intelligence committees aren't really working. The FISA court, which was supposed to oversee mm -hmm. surveillance, 
the judges have sort of become a rubber stamp. Uh, half of the surveillance of Carter Page, the Trump aide, was improper. You know, there was there was faulty evidence. It should have shouldn't have gone on for as long as it went on. It, you know, there was not surveillance of Trump Tower, as Trump claims, is exaggerating, but there's right. there's abuses happening. And so the digital age has given these agencies more power than ever to spy on us, every detail of our lives. And you know, we're, we're, we need, ironically, one of the few, and I'll try to end on a positive note, you know, one of the funniest and unique alliances in Congress today is between Rand Paul, the Republican libertarian from mm -hmm. Kentucky, mm -hmm. and Ron Wyden, the liberal Democrat from Oregon. And there is like wide agreement, you know, from the left and the right about our need to protect privacy. But mm -hmm. we're so polarized that we haven't been able to come up with like legislation and reforms to kind of govern the digital age. The 70s, there was a crisis, there was an investigation and reforms and a new system emerged. I'm convinced, you know, we can do that again now mm -hmm. and create a better system that I think disperses power. I, I want oversight by all three branches of government. I don't want a more powerful president like Bill Barr does. And I'm a journalist, but I want more transparency. Mm -hmm. And so Trump's refusal to hand over anything to impeachment investigators, you know, Richard Nixon handed over things to impeachment yeah. investigators. Yeah. That was terrifying. So this is a dangerous moment for American democracy, but I do think there are kind of basic principles people believe in. And I think that, you know, we can get through this. People should be, my little line is that be skeptical of kind of objective fact and skeptical of objective journalists and skeptical of objective, you know, government officials, but don't be cynical about them. Yeah. You know, I think that there are people trying to get across basic facts and, you know, because we, we have to reform and, and govern the, you know, come up with rules for the government, sorry, for the digital age and protect our privacy and, and counter all this disinformation for political gain. Uh, anyway, I'm convinced we can do it. Um, we've done it before. Um, and we have to do it because it is very dangerous what's happening today. Okay, well, I really hope you're right, David. <laughs> I'm trying. It's a it's a pivotal election, and I'm it not is. saying it who is. should vote for who, but everyone should vote. And um, and um, you're you know, really you know. not going to say who should vote for who. That's, that's <laughs> no, I don't think that's my. No, I no. don't. I I, I don't like, think. Yeah. It's no, it's back to um, you know yeah. Clapper and Brennan and that 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 argument. Um, yeah. And it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, don't believe the conspiracy theories, whether it's, um, you know, far left or far right conspiracy theories is my thing. And, and yeah. if it's not in the like, quote unquote, mainstream media, if it's not on the Wall Street Journal and you're a conservative, that's, it's probably not true. Um, and if you're liberal and you're seeing some crazy thing about Trump and it's not in the New York Times, it's probably not true. I know that people are going to scoff at that, but, um, you know, there's, like I said, libel laws and other things that govern the way most news organizations report and um, all the, the, the vitriol and conspiracy theories on all sides, I think is just dangerous and leading to distrust and more and more division. Well, thank you. This book is, it's really great. It's a really great read too. So actually it's a lot of characters, a lot of juicy details and a great <laughs> rendering of history. Seriously, really great. Well, Coming from you as a fantastic writer and journalist um, who I've known for decades, that means a great deal. So but anyway, right. thank you for doing this a little bit. Thanks, David.